My name is Dr. Barry Goodell at University of Wisconsin, and welcome to this edition of Clinical Corner. Now, for those of you who've watched Clinical Corner before, you know we, we frequently pick relatively concrete, um, definable topics to discuss and to summarize. Um, today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about something a bit more ambiguous, and that's the rapidly emerging area of, of psychedelic molecules in neurology and psychiatry. So to do that, I'm really pleased to have two experts come and join us. First, Dr. Kurt LaFrance, Professor of Psychiatry and Neurology from Brown University. Welcome, Kurt. And Dr. Cody Wenther, Associate Professor of Pharmacy, also at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for joining. So Cody, I wanna start off with you because I think a lot of us are somewhat confused when we talk about psychedelics. What exactly are we talking about? What are these, what are these molecules that we're talking about? What are the range of them? And maybe share a little bit what we think these drugs are doing. For sure. Uh, yeah, it's probably not surprising there's a little bit of confusion out there because in recent years, the definition of what we've been calling psychedelics seems to be expanding slightly. So the, the classical definition of psychedelics would encompass molecules like LSD, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine, mescaline. These are all agents that act on serotonergic systems and particularly activate serotonin 2A, although they, they certainly hit a bunch of other serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors. So when we think about psychedelics, that's kind of the core area. Um, but in recent years, ketamine, which is a, a dissociative anesthetic and, and works through NMDA receptors, possibly also some opioid mechanism, um, and MDMA, uh, which is an intactogen uh, and has a broader monoaminergic profile, have been discussed because of the way that they've been used cl in clinical trials uh, akin to psychedelics um, in conjunction with, with therapy. Okay, thanks. Um so let's let's shift from there and talk about okay why what is do we have evidence okay so there's great interest in this this uh, whole grouping of of drugs but do we have any evidence first I'm going to start with you Cody then go to Kurt um, do we have evidence in epilepsy clinical evidence that these drugs can be beneficial or harmful I would say as of early 2025 the short answer is no because all clinical trials that have been examining these substances have generally excluded anyone with a, a past or current history of seizures. So that's really limited, the evidence mm. base that's available for epilepsy specifically. Okay. Kurt, are you, are you aware of any in silico experiments that have looked at this in epilepsy? My limited understanding is that there are some models that are being produced for epilepsy with uh, some of the hallucinogens. Okay. Now, Kurt, as a follow-up to that, tell me about in the psychiatry realm, because we know that obviously um, uh, mental health issues are a common comorbid uh, finding in patients with epilepsy, depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, uh, just some examples. What do we know there? Or what do we think? Well, as Cody mentioned, uh, ketamine has been used as an analgesic and as an anesthetic uh, for years. So it's not new to medicine, it's just newer to psychiatry and neurology. And along those lines, one of the, F, one of the FDA approved treatment, uh, treatments for uh, treatment resistant depression is esketamine, uh, the nasal inhaled version. Uh, and that's been shown to reduce depression scores and suicidality in adults. So knowing that, uh, in epilepsy, that there are a large number of neuropsychiatric comorbidities that exist, such as, as you said, Barry, you know, anywhere from a third to half of our patients with epilepsy have depression. Many of them have anxiety disorders. Some of them have cognitive uh, symptoms, whether it's from ADHD or from traumatic brain injury. And then uh, functional neurological disorders are very common in our patients with epilepsy. So in light of that, realizing that some of the uh, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy has been used with one FDA indication for treatment resistant depression and also clinical trials in mm -hmm. PTSD, OCD, um, some substance use disorders 
and even in functional neurological disorders, there's room uh, for further investigation, I think, to, to look for psychedelic assisted therapy in our patients with epilepsy with the comorbidities. So that could be a little bit of a different avenue to approach in future research efforts is not necessarily maybe focusing on just seizure reduction, but looking at, you know, the bidirectional interaction with yes. both in functional neurologic syndromes as well as, you know, depression. Thank you. Okay, I want to shift now to um, the potential downsides of this. And Cody, let me just ask you, do we have any data on potential pharmacokinetic um, interactions or pharmacodynamic interactions with the existing either anti-seizure medicines or antidepressant mm -hmm. medicines? Yeah, there is some literature out there on this. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in pharmacodynamics uh, to, to start um, because there are a lot of psychotropic medications that modify both the acute experience with psychedelics, which is the lens through which a lot of people were looking at, at this in the first place. Uh, but then also um, the question is whether those then subsequently modify any therapeutic effects that might be being looked for. So uh, compounds like antidepressants and antipsychotics, um, certainly serotonin 2A antagonists, um, dopamine antagonists. These have been looked at, um, and often they do have some degree of diminishment in the psychedelic uh, response, right, in the subjective effects of the compounds. Um, other notable interactions from the pharmacokinetic side uh, are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, particularly with MDMA. I would say this is the one area where there's currently strong evidence that it could be a potentially fatal interaction, the combination of MDOA and an MAOI inhibitor. Um, and then other enzymes to, to watch out for are inhibition of 2D6. Um, and then again, for, for MDMA, maybe a little bit of 3A4. But um, as we well know, a lot of our uh, antidepressant medications and other psychotropic medications interact with, with 2D6. So that's one that tends to flag up quite a bit. Um, as that can be a big mechanism for uh, metabolism of, of some of these psychedelics. So what, I, what I'm hearing here is that, you know, there's potentially a role here, but there's, you know, we get in the realm of polytherapy, polypharmacy, there's going to be a lot more complexity to this. Um, Kurt, are there any populations you're particularly worried about um, of potentially trying to bring these agents in? Well, Cody mentioned earlier that of the, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy and the uh, psychedelic clinical trials, they excluded patients with epilepsy or with histories of seizures. So we really don't know a lot about the potential impact. Um, also in children, uh, we know that some of the serotonergic agents might increase depression and suicidality. Mm. And so realizing that it's, uh, if it's, off-label, if you are going to be considering using that, and also the 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 risk of kind of increasing suicidality. To to that effect, when the um, the, when the FDA released the statement about uh, increased suicidality and uh, in anti seizure medications a number of years ago, that actually I believe helped the the epilepsy uh, clinic community because it made us aware we need to track uh, what are what's going on with our with our patients so to be able to ask at the visit not just about the seizures but also about the comorbidities and depression and sleep changes uh, that's just good medicine and so along those lines making sure to be aware of that in our patients is important great well it sounds like what we need to we've got an, an exciting area of potentially new therapeutic options but there's a lot we need to learn in our particular patient group and, and patients with epilepsy. And there's potentially some um, upside and there's potentially some, some negatives too. So Kurt, let me just ask you, in addition to the, the pharmacokinetic um, interactions that, that uh, Dr. Wenther was alluding to, uh, tell me about what, what that could translate to in terms of adverse effects and what other kind of things might we be concerned about? Yeah, so clinically, uh, being aware of adverse events and side effects, a few different things to note, uh, common psychedelic side effects 
include acute psychiatric effects, as you would expect, hallucinations or panic attacks and psychosis can be common with LSD and MDMA. And then autonomic effects with tachycardia and hypertension uh, and hyperthermia. And then serotonin syndrome is another thing to be aware of with this class of medications. Well, gentlemen, it, it seems like we have a lot to learn here. Um, this seems like an exciting new um, group of molecules with interesting mechanisms that may truly end up being a benefit to our, our patients uh, with epilepsy, especially those with um, comorbid psychiatric disorders. And so it really does open up some, some exciting opportunities. But what I'm also hearing from you is there are, you know, potential limitations and potential uh, downsides that we don't even recognize yet. So with that, um, I want to leave it with uh, you gentlemen. Is there anything else that you want to add to our conversation uh, today? Yeah, in addition to the populations that Kurt mentioned um, that we might want to potentially be extra cautious in, I would say folks um, who are pregnant or have a risk of becoming pregnant, certainly we want to avoid yeah. this. And um, people with uh, severe cardiovascular disease, uncontrolled blood pressure due to that autonomic activation. Mm. Uh, and then one other uh, interaction I, I feel like I should definitely point out is um, psilocybin and lithium actually has a pretty mm. strong uh, level of evidence for increasing uh, seizures, uh, particularly compared with other mm. anti-epileptic medications, things like lamotrigine. So definitely one to watch out for. Were these, uh, this study, was that data from people with epilepsy or people with bipolar disorder? So th that was primarily in a bipolar population. Oh, ah, okay. That's, thank you for noting that. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, gentlemen, thank you very much for a great uh, discussion today. I truly appreciate you bringing your expertise to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.